Hey everybody, um, welcome back to uh, another video lecture. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed your spring break. Um, so what we're gonna be doing this week is studying uh, a concept we call conservation of energy. So conservation of energy is something that you might've heard of before. Uh, it, it, it's this idea that uh, whenever there is energy in an object, uh, that energy can't be destroyed. Um, so, so if that object were to lose energy, that energy were to be go go somewhere else, and in, either into the surroundings or into another object. Um, and we see this in all kinds of different examples. Um, we're going to focus mostly on potential and kinetic energy, um, specifically gravitational potential energy, and how when an object falls, uh, it it it's gaining kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy has to come from somewhere else, uh, which is coming from the force of gravity. Um, but we can see conservation of energy in a whole bunch of different things. So uh, one example of conservation of energy uh, would be uh, the fact that whenever uh, there's friction, there's also heat. So if you take your hands and you rub them together, uh, you, that's how you can warm them up, right? You're Basically, what you're doing is you're... you're um, you're allowing friction, you're putting kinetic energy into your hands by moving them, and you're allowing friction to take that energy away. So friction is taking that energy from your hands, and it's giving it off as heat energy. And then you feel that heat thermal energy that's absorbed into your hands, and that's why when you rub your hands together like that, it warms them up. Um, so that's just one example of conservation of energy. Uh, we see this in all types of different areas of physics. Um, and it's really one of the guiding principles for a lot of 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 physics. So um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the notes. Um, we're going to be starting on page uh, nine today. Um, and we're going to start here with this definition. So conservation of energy. Um, and, and in order to de describe conservation of energy, we have to have these forces that are conservative forces. Right. So uh one conservative force is gravity we work with gravity all the time um and so the force of gravity is a force that will conserve energy that's what it means to be a conservative force um a force that's non-conservative would be something like friction because friction is going to take that energy and it's going to give it off in terms of thermal energy or sound or something like that versus uh, gravity, which takes that one type of energy and converts it to an, another type of energy. Um, so as we get into this, these, these ideas and concepts will make a little bit more sense. Right? But we, we can classify forces as either being conservative or non-conservative forces. Um, so the basic definition uh, of a conservative force would be a force that can take away energy and then give it all back. Keyword being all. Um, what kind of force could take away energy and not give it back? So this would be something like friction, and this is what we would consider to be a non-conservative force. Um, and another force you might be thinking of, uh, so some, some chemical reactions, um, so there's some chemical potential energy. So sometimes when two uh, would would be another example. So sometimes when like two um, reagents or, or two chemicals react um, with one another, you get you get some product from that reaction, and uh, some reactions are reversible, but some are not. Um, right? If you mix salt and water uh, together, you're going to get salt water. It's 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 a process. You, it requires energy put back into that system in order to extract the salt from that salt water. Um, namely, you need to evaporate off, you know, all of the water. 
Um, so you need to put more heat energy into that system. The idea with friction taking away energy and not giving it back is, is think about when you're driving in your car on the highway. You, you're, if you're going like 65 or 70 miles per hour and then you take your foot off the gas, um, there's, there's friction and, and air resistance that's slowing your car down. These forces are taking away that energy, but there's, there's no way to capture that energy and then give it back to another source. So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about versus um, gravitation, which when you throw a ball up in the air, let's say, uh, that, that object had kinetic energy because you threw it, but when it gets to the top, it stops. And when it's at the top of its motion and it stops, it no longer has uh, kinetic energy, but it has potential energy. Gravity can then take that potential energy, and as it falls, it can give it all back in terms of kinetic energy. So that's what we mean by this, this, this giving it all back um, versus an energy taking it away and not giving it back. All right. So uh, we're going to focus on in the next few days, like this week, we're going to focus on this idea of conservation of energy with conservative forces only. So we're not going to deal with friction um, at all, but we're just going to focus on uh, this idea that all the energy is going to be conserved. There's no friction acting. And so let's look at a practical example here. Um, so if you are, have ever skateboarded before or played a, a skateboarding video, video game, you, you know what a half pipe is. Uh, it's this little sloped ramp. The skater will, you know, it comes over like this. The skater starts out here on his skateboard. Got a little helmet on because he's being safe. All right. And then what happens is when he goes down here, right, he's at rest here. He'll go down here and he'll pick up speed. And when he's at the bottom, this is when the velocity is at the max. This is when he's going the fastest. And then as he comes back up to here, his velocity will come to zero again. And then he'll and then he'll fall back the other way. And then he'll repeat and it'll go back down this way and come back up. And and he'll he'll repeat that that cycle, and so in this in this energy or in this uh, problem we have energy con uh, conservation happening. When we're at either point, so what kind of energy at the bottom of the half pipe? When we're we're at the bottom of the half pipe here, this point here only has kinetic energy. Assuming if we're looking at this as the ground. This would be a height of zero, and this would be some other height of whatever is defined h. Um, since he doesn't have any height, he's not going to have any gravitational potential energy, but he will have kinetic energy because he's moving. Um, as the border moves from the lowest point to the highest point, what is the force of gravity doing to the speed of the border? So from the lowest point to the highest point, here to here or here to here, what is the force of gravity doing to the speed of the border? Well, it's slowing it down. It's taking it from its max speed to a slower speed, speeding up, slowing down. So uh, as the border moves, um, he's, it's, it's slowing him down. And uh, slowing him down or uh, Another way we would say is, is he's losing kinetic energy. But if energy is conserved, that kinetic energy has to go somewhere. Now, we're going to ignore friction for the case. But yeah, there would be some friction, right? You can actually hear this when you hear the skateboarder going down the half pipe. You can actually hear, um, you know, the, the, the sound effects of, right, the, the, like the sound of the wheels. You can hear that. And some of that is is some of that energy being lost in terms of friction. So we're hearing hearing that sound come off. Um, but we're going to ignore that that piece, and we're going to say it's not a significant amount. Um, you know, assuming the board wheels are are sliding well, they're sticking to the ground as they as they spin. We're not going to lose a whole lot of energy due to friction, right? So if energy is conserved, then that means that that the energy has to go somewhere. 
And that's where it goes into this force called, or it goes into this energy type called potential energy. Okay. So, and, and where is this energy coming from? Well, it's coming from the fact that it's doing work. So the force of gravity is doing what kind of work to the border as he's slowing down? So um, the work would be uh, negative. Um, when upward, positive, when moving upward, when moving downward. So as the, um, as the skateboarder moves downward, gravity is doing positive work, speeding it up. Um, when the border is moving upward, it's doing negative work. So we have positive and negative work, all right, like we talked about in the last unit. Okay, so the force of gravity takes all of this kinetic energy of the border away. Where does it go? It goes into this new type of gravity, which we call gravitational potential energy. All right, so the force of gravity took all of the kinetic energy of the border away as we go from the bottom back up to the top. And that goes into an energy stored as gravitational potential energy, GPE. Um, I, I also, Mr. Roberts likes to write it as GPE. Um, I, I like writing it as um, potential energy with the G down here, PEG, or potential energy gravity. Um, so you might see I do that. Mr. Roberts might write it like that. It's the same same idea. All right. So um, gravity stores energy as this new type of energy we call gravitational potential energy, which is essentially a, the the energy that's associated with an object's height. So the more height an object has, the more height, the more gravitational potential energy an object has. Right. Now we can also um, realize that gravity acts on mass in a certain way. So the more massive an object is, actually the more energy it has as well. Uh, and then also, if you think about it, gravity is different for each planet. So there's this acceleration due to gravity, little g, which we talked about, g of negative 9.8 for the Earth's surface, this is going to go into effect in terms of the gravitational equation as well. Um, and so we have this, this equation for gravitational potential energy, uh, PEG equals m times g times h. Uh, again, we're going we're gonna to keep this as a um, this G is 9.8 positive, and we're going to deal with the negative sign. If we, we can't have negative, we can have negative potential energy. Unlike kinetic energy, which was always positive, potential energy can be negative. But we're going to take care of that negative sign in terms of the height. All right, so G, we're going to leave as a, a positive uh, 9.8. Um, M is mass because the mass of the object is going to affect how much um, gravitational potential energy it has. And this is going to be the height above some reference point. The cool thing about these problems is we get to pick the reference point, whatever makes the most sense. So gravitational potential energy really depends on um, like what height you're at. But it, it's kind of tricky because you you might be on the first floor of a building and it doesn't feel like you're going to fall right because you're on the floor and that is the same feeling that you would have if you were on like let's say the fourth floor of a building um but the difference in 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 the person that's on the first floor and the fourth floor is if they uh no longer have the ground underneath them and they fall towards the earth the person on the first floor isn't going to fall but the person on the fourth floor is so relative to one another the person on the fourth floor has a greater potential energy than the person on the first floor. But we could set each of their heights to zero and say at that point in time, neither one of them has um, potential energy. So it's a little bit tricky. Um, we're going to see that this height variable can can kind of change in these problems. All right. Uh, so let's 
let's uh, look at a couple examples. We'll do some together. Um, let's see where we're at in time. Okay, 15 minutes, good. All right, so uh, conservation of energy without friction, when gravity is the only force acting on an object, kinetic energy can be converted to potential energy, which can be converted back to kinetic energy. That's what we just saw in that half pipe example. Gravity was the only force acting on the border. So it's converting kinetic energy back to potential energy and then potential energy, which can be converted back to kinetic energy. So there's a switch of energy going from one state to the other. The total amount of energy at any point in the problem must be equal to any other location in that, which means if I'm looking at this example again, if I'm here, I have the same amount of energy, total energy, than I do when I'm down here. The difference is in what form that energy is. When I'm at the bottom of the half pipe and I'm moving, all the energy is going to be kinetic energy. When I'm at the top and I'm not moving, all the energy is in gravitational potential energy. And when I'm somewhere in the middle, then it's in both forms. So right here, I don't quite have as much kinetic energy as I have when I'm at the bottom because I'm not going as fast as I'm, I would be going at the bottom. But I also don't have as much potential energy as I would if I'm at the top because I'm not at, uh, at the same height. So I'm at a lower height. So I have both less potential and less kinetic. But if I were to add those two numbers up, they would be equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom or the potential energy at the top. And this is what this beautiful equation is for. Right. Uh, the individual amounts of kinetic energy and potential energy may change, but the total should always remain the same which we can express mathematically as kinetic energy initial plus potential energy gravitation initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy gravitation final. Right. Uh, so here you see this PE, uh, P G P E instead of PEG. But again, what, what do I and F always mean? Initial and final means that's my two initial energies are going to be equal to my two final energies. All right. A note. Sometimes these values are zero. So you don't, don't feel like you need to plug in something for each of these terms, right? They can all be something a little bit different. Now remember, what were these two what were these two equations equal to? Let's just rewrite those. So kinetic energy at any point in time is one half mv squared. And potential energy at any time is mgh. So what this equation is going to tell us is that my the one half mv initial squared plus mg height initial equals one half mv final squared plus mg height final. So that's another way of writing this. Um, and I'm actually going to write that write that out. Um, Try, I'm going to try and write it down right below here. So I have to write a little bit smaller. One half mv initial squared, that's my kinetic energy initial, plus mgh initial. The mass is typically not going to change um, unless you're dealing with something like, uh, like rockets, where the rocket fuel, um, you know, changes as it gets to a higher height then you have you know mass is going to be a function because you're actually losing mass as you um explode the rocket fuel uh so so typically the mass isn't going to vary that much as we go so we're going to keep this normally as a constant and and only our height would change um for our examples but you could see an example where the mass does change gravity really isn't going to change too much uh even even in a rocket problem where you're, you know, we'd probably want to keep that as a function because as you get further out in the atmosphere, um, this G does go down a little bit, um, but really not, not by that much. So um, we're going to keep those constants. And then we have one half M V final squared plus M G H final. All right, uh, so <clears throat> how do we use this equation in a problem? So let's look at a simple example here. Uh, a one kilogram mass is dropped off a uh, 20 meter tall building. All right, 
So using kinematics, find the speed of the mass when it's 20 meters above the ground, 13 meters above the ground, seven meters above the ground, and when it reaches the ground. So here's, here's our picture of this. We have our guy dropping a rock 20, 13, seven, and zero. And what we want to do in this first part is figure out what the velocity is. Now using kinematics. So th this, I, I, I want to relate, show how this is actually just another way of doing the problems that we already know how to do. Um, and it might be easier. Uh, and so maybe sometimes we want to use energy conservation instead of using kinematics. Um, but just as a refresher, you, we had this equation, V final squared equals V initial squared um, plus 2A uh, delta Y or G delta Y um, in, in terms of our acceleration. And um, if we're looking at you know each of these different parts, when it's 20 meters above the ground, that's obviously when it's still at rest when we're dropping it off the 20 meter tall building. So at, at, at a height of 20 meters, then uh, our velocity would be zero. So I'm gonna put V of 20 to be uh, the velocity at height 20. Um, when I look at height of 13 meters, Well, I can I can figure this out by using this equation. My v initial was zero, um, so my v at thirteen squared uh, will equal zero plus two times negative nine point eight. We're going to use the negative sign here because we're using kinematics. It's important. And what was my delta y? Well, my delta y changed from twenty to thirteen, so my delta y was negative seven. So these negative signs cancel out about seven meters. Uh, multiply that through and take the square root, and you get uh, a v of eleven point seven meters per second uh, at a height of seven meters. Same idea: zero squared plus two times negative nine point eight. But this time it's fallen thirteen meters because now it's at seven. And this would give us a velocity of 15.9 meters per second. And finally, at a height of uh, zero meters, it's fallen 20 meters. And uh, we can use negative 9.8 and negative 20. I'm running out of room. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and then this will tell us that V at height zero uh, equals 19.8 meters per second. All right, so we can do all this. We can find these velocities. Um, and, and you know, it all works out. But we're actually going to show that, um, you know, if we look at the energy from these velocities that we have at each of these points, we're going to show that energy is conserved in this next exercise. Okay. Uh, so part B says find the kinetic energy of the mass at each height above the ground. All right, and that's that's we're going to put these uh, values here. So this this first one, um, the velocity we found was zero. And since kinetic energy is one half mv squared, then this will just be one half times the mass of the rock, which is said to be one kilogram. times the velocity of zero, no kinetic energy. All right, at 13, our velocity was 11.7. And so if we, again, use this same equation for kinetic energy, one half times one times 11.7 squared, uh, we get a kinetic energy of 68.6 .6 joules. All right. Um, we'll just go through all the kinetic energy parts. So the uh, next one, our velocity at 7 was 15.96. Which means our kinetic energy would be one half times one times 15.96 squared, or uh, 127.4 joules. Uh, 
joules. And then finally, our velocity at zero was uh, 19.8, which means our kinetic energy at height zero is uh, 196 joules. All right, so we've got the height at each, uh, or we got the velocity at each point, and we use those to find the kinetic energy at each point. For the gravitational potential potential energy of the mass at each height above the ground, find that finding that uh, we're going to use the equation E equals mgh. So here we're talking a height. This is what I was talking about before. Our height of zero we're going to define uh, down here. which means each of these is going to be positive. So this is going to be h equals 7, h equals 13, and then finally h equals 20 at the top. But I could have just as well defined this as 0. So what I could have done was I could have said this was a height of 0, which means this would be a height of negative 7, this would be a height of negative 13, and this would be a height of negative 20 we, like we did in the projectile motion problems right we said it started from the height of 20 and it fell you know 20 meters so we could use these as our negative height values but we're just going to start with all positives so we're going to start with height of zero at the bottom um but just know that you know we could do it that way if we wanted to um so let's go ahead and erase these Um, so using those height values, let's find MGH. Uh, th these are pretty simple calculations, especially when mass is one. So it's one times 9.8. Again, we're going to use positive here because we're going to take care of the, si the sign in, in terms of, uh, the height here. So in this case, we're going to use positive 20. If we wanted it to be negative potential energy, um, we, we would, we would put the negative sign in here. So just keeping that in mind, um, keep that as a positive 9.8, even though we've been using, we use negative 9.8 up here. All right, uh, so this case is 9.8 times 20, which gives us 19, uh, or sorry, 196 joules for our potential energy, 196. Uh, for height of 13, 1 times 9.8 times 13. Uh, this actually gives us 127.4. Um, and you might even be able to guess what the next one is going to be. 1 times 9.8 times 7. If you guessed that it was going to be 68.6, you would be correct. Uh, and then the last one, obviously, is going to be zero because it's got a height of zero. But what what's interesting here, you probably saw, is that this is, sim is the same as that. This is the same as that. That's the same as that. All right. And we can see this energy being transferred from from no kinetic energy to all kinetic energy all potential energy to no potential energy. So when we look at our total energy, which is just going to be um, potential energy plus kinetic energy, um, we see across the board it's 196 joules, 0 plus 196, 68.6 uh, .6 plus 127.4, 196, 68.4 plus 127.4, Uh, 196, and then finally 0 plus 196, 196. So we see energy being conserved in this example. All right. Now, again, this is neglecting air resistance, would, which would take some of the energy out, um, depending on how aerodynamic this thing was. All right. Um, but that's going to be where we wrap up for today. Um, just to kind of uh, recap, 
we we looked at what conservation of energy meant this idea that energy is transferred before between two forms we looked as, at gravity acting as the conservative force and so we saw in this example that as gravity acted on this rock the kinetic energy changed from uh being zero up to 196 and gravity the potential energy from gravity changed from 196 down to zero and the total energy was conserved Right. So tomorrow we'll look at a couple more examples of this, and then on Thursday and Friday this week, I will let you guys uh, uh, tackle a problem set uh, and and see if you can solve some of these questions. So, um, all right, that's it. That's it. Uh, thanks for watching.